Hello, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us today. Just some housekeeping notes before we dive into the meat of the webinar. Um, first of all, we want to thank you again for joining us. Um, this is a family program and it is rated PG. So we do ask that you keep all of the, the chat um, or the questions in the Q&A on topic um, and, and clean and family friendly. Uh, failing to do that will potentially lead to you being removed from the webinar altogether. So we'll just keep it nice and, and clean and have a good time with this. So we're going to talk today about Nevada moose. My name is Julie Gabrielson. I'm a conservation educator out of Elko, Nevada. That's the eastern region of the state. And my moderator in the background is Laura McLeod. She is one of my counterparts down in the southern region of the state. And today we also have our guest expert, Carrie Hubner. She is the area seven by game biologist up here in the eastern part of the state. So what is a moose? <laughs> A quick overview of moose in general, um, and then we're going to dive into Nevada moose history today. Um, in this particular slide, the, <laughs> the picture of the deer is not a really great representation of deer in the state of Nevada, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what is in the same family as a moose. Uh, the moose is, is part of the Cervidae family. That includes the moose, the elk, the caribou, and deer. Um, caribou, elk, and deer, they've all been in North America about 100,000 years. Uh, moose, they have about four, well, they have four different subspecies to the moose family. <clears throat> Where do they come from? Well, moose being the newest to North America, um, they've only been here about 15,000 years. They have originated from Siberia, and there's several theories as to how they got over into North America, but the bulk of those, those theories really come down to the Bering Strait and the land bridge um, between there. So our types of moose, the four subspecies of moose in, moose in North America, um, they have some primary differences um, which are mainly location and antler size. Um, they also have differences in hair colors. Um, they can be a little bit deceiving in those differences sometimes though, so those are not always a true tell. And in shed season, you know, once they've dropped those antlers on those bulls, um, the only way that, or the best way that you can tell the difference from a distance of the bulls and the cows um, is actually white hairs around the vulva of the cow moose. So right below the dock of, what, of her tail, you'll see that white patch. And that's a really good indicator that you're looking at a cow moose. So we're gonna start with our Alaskan moose. Uh, this is the largest of all four species. Um, antlers typically grow over 80 inches. Um, the bulls will be about six feet tall, 1600 pounds. Their range is over most of Alaska, parts of Western Yukon in Canada. Uh, their population is estimated around 225,000 and about 7,000 are harvested each year in Alaska alone. Uh, Boone and Crockett world record has a 76 inch antler spread. Then our Northwestern moose, uh, six and a half feet high at the shoulder, 1300 pounds. So you can tell even though they're, they're considered a smaller moose than the Alaskan moose, it's still about the same as far as height and weight. Um, but a bigger difference is the antlers will get about 70 inches and plus. You won't see many that are over 80. Um, their range is British Columbia, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario, um, Ontario, or sorry, Ontario, uh, Northwest Territories uh, and Yukon, um, even Northwestern parts of Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Their population, population estimates are around 380,000. Then our eastern moose, uh, similar in size to the north, northwestern, your cows will average about 850 pounds and a six-year-old bull is around 1,100 pounds. The largest recorded main bull was estimated at actually 1,750 pounds. Uh, their range is Hudson Bay, Great Lakes, Nova Scotia, Quebec, Newfoundland, Ontario and Canada, and in the U.S. Population estimate is about 290,000 for those. 
then our Shiras moose, um, which is also our Nevada moose. <laughs> Bulls weigh between 600 and 1400 pounds. The cows can get between about five and 1200 pounds. Their range is, is the most Southern range of all four. Um, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Southwest Alberta, um, and now uh, Nevada. <laughs> Their world record um, is at a 53 inch antler spread. So you can see that these guys being the most southerly, they're also the smaller of the, the species um, and theirs will get like 50 inches and above in their antler spread. Let's talk about some of their behavior. So their lifespan is 15 to 25 years. They are the least social in the family. Uh, they really like their solitude. Um, active times are at sunrise and sunset, which is a crepuscular animal. Uh, a diurnal would be a daytime eater and a nocturnal would be your nighttime eater. Some cool adaptations that they have is their hollow hair that helps to insulate them from the cold. Uh, their hump on that back is actually a massive shoulder muscle and that comes from the need to carry such a heavy head and especially for the bulls, those um, antlers are quite, um, quite big. <laughs> uh, they have varied forms of communication. Um, a lot of their forms in between them are, are almost inaudible to humans, um, but they will have some loud, <laughs> um, loud communications for us as humans when we're getting too close to them. Um, roaring, moaning, and grunts will also be part of that. Some more of their behavior and adaptations is they can run up to 35 miles per hour uh, for shorter distances. For longer periods of time, they can still do 20 miles an hour at a trot. They're really, really strong swimmers up to about six miles per hour for up to two hours at a time. And they can swim as far as 12, almost 12 and a half miles at, at one go. Um, one of my favorite adaptations is that they can close their nostrils. Um, and that really comes back to their ability to graze underwater because they do forage underwater. They can stay underwater for up to 30 seconds and they dive for plants in water over 18 feet deep. <clears throat> um, they're not overly fond of jumping. So if you ever see one jump, they're more likely to be jumping from a standstill than from a gallop. They're ultimately built for snow. Um, these are, these these moose are extremely tolerant of cold temperatures. Uh, their wide hooves are built to act like snowshoes. They've even um, come across you know, some of these moose in really, really deep snow using their forearms on their front legs to help ease the intensity of the sinking as they're crossing that deep snow. Uh, long legs for deep snow travel, two feet or less of snow really doesn't inhibit them, um, but a little bit you know, compact or crusted snow at almost any depth is actually an extreme energy limitation um, and re really reduces their foraging range as well. So with that, their heat regulation is really important. <clears throat> and they have several different ways of, of regulating their heat. Um, they are built for ambient temperatures of about 23 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter and, um, no, and no more than above 57 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Anything beyond those temperatures um, is really stressful and discomforting for them. So you might see them panting with their open mouth, um, like you would see a, a dog even doing. Uh, they might move into the, the deeper valleys in the mountains and the draws. They'll exaggerate and sprawl out in their sleep. <laughs> and there's even some speculation that their foraging in water is another use um, or another way that they regulate their heat. Their territory, um, <laughs> they really are, because they're so solitary, you won't see them together very often. Um, territories are not shared between cows and bulls. Um, an average territory for either one of them is two to four miles, and it can get up to 100 plus miles depending on the number of moose that are in the area. Um, and cows with calves are very solitary. Um, and a lot of that comes back to um, avoid predation on those calves. Cows will allow, or cows will allow their calves in individual zones until that calf becomes a, a yearling, and then she'll actually drive them away. Um, orphaned calves are better tolerated by bulls than cows on most occasions. 
their courtship is all a little bit different between the um, four different species. So your, your Shires and Alaskans, they're more of a, a harem mating, which means the, harem, the cows all come together. They um, congregate into the rutting area of the bull um, and they, you know, they, they hang out with each other. And same thing with the, um, with the Alaskans, the barren and lactating cows build harems around the bulls um, and the calves are not present. On your Eastern and your Northwestern, breeding occurs in pairs with the rut actually controlled by the cow. So each cow has its own mating area and actually lures the bull into it. Um, and their estrus is not synced. So a calf in that situation will actually stay in the, in the mating area and visible to the cow um, and her attending bull. The bull will, will cautiously approach. Um, his head will be in a higher position to detect the smells. He'll use that lip phlegm that he'll do. Um, and if she's not in estrus, um, she'll avoid him and completely walk away from him. Um, if in, in peak estrus, then she'll actually allow the bull to smell her and then um, the mating will, will commence. Uh, cow's heat cycle are typically 22 to 28 days. Uh, gestation period is eight months. One twin is actually born about every three years. Um, and so it's, it's really kind of a, a different thing between the four different species. On our bulls, they have bells or dewlaps, and cows actually have them as well. They're just not as defined and, um, and as big as the bulls get. But these tails can actually freeze off in extreme temps, and that kind of comes back into another topic that we're going to go into a little bit later. Um, seldom in the present, or I mean, seldom will you see them in older bulls. Uh, the bell itself will continue to grow even after it's lost. But um, that smaller, that lower section will actually fall off typically because of frostbite. Um, there's no definitive answer as to why they have the bell, um, also known as a dewlap. Um, some speculated use is that it's used as part of um, courtship and mating. Um, another is that the bell evolved as a visual indicator of their gender um, relative to age and rank, um, especially during the antlerless period. <clears throat> But it's been noted that cows do not intentionally search for contact with a bull's bell, but the bell is a carrier of scent. On to our calving. Everybody loves to see a calf. <laughs> so our calves are born, oops, sorry about that. Uh, calves are born without spots. Uh, they have a 50% loss of calves by six weeks. Um, calves weighing more than about 35 pounds at birth have almost a 95% chance of surviving to a month old. Less than 25 pounds, they actually have a greater than 50% chance of not making it to a month. Around 50% of calves die due to bear or wolf attacks before they're ever six weeks old. Um, and they gain about two and two plus pounds per day while they're actively nursing. And after about six months is when calves are weaned. Their habitat, um, <laughs> not what you would expect. I mean, you would expect to see something different in Nevada with them congregating to the state. Um, but the boreal forests, the mixed forests, large delta floodplains, tundra, subalpine shrub, um, stream valleys, those are where you will typically find moose. Um, mature aspen and white birch are used extensively in the late summer and autumn. They seek aquatic areas late spring through autumn for drinking. Uh, for insect relief, um, aquatic food, because they really do like that aquatic um, vegetation, and thermal regulation. So that's another way we talked about a little bit earlier that they, they'll actually get into that water to help, you know, control that, that temperature on their, on their hides. Um, and on the insect relief, that actually, you know, it helps them to get away from some of those horse and deer flies. They do find the forage in the aquatic areas um, really palatable and high in sodium um, than your plant than your land-based plants are. So they have the the ruminant four-chambered stomach. They're a browser. So as a browser, they primarily eat shrubs and trees. Um, in the northern um, areas, they eat woody twigs during the winter, even. So to give you a good comparison on what their their diet is. 
they're 90% shrubs. Trees are about 8% forbs. Um, sorry, 90% shrubs and trees, 8% forbs, 2% grass. In comparison to an elk, an elk will eat 17% shrubs and trees, 14% forbs, and 69% grass. So they really do um, like different areas and different habitat from each other. An adult will need about 40 pounds per day to keep itself going. Uh, they're more selective than you would think in the plant species that they eat. And their nutrition is also essential to help with that thermoregulation. In predation and disease, um, they have a couple. So in most of their areas, um, of Nevada, their primary predation concerns are obviously humans, um, grizzly, wolves, and black bears. And, the, and the, the black bears really come in play with the calves. In Nevada, we would, add, we would you know, say that mountain lions are really the primary predation concern when it comes to the moose. Um, as we don't have black bears or grizzlies or wolves in the region that they're in. Um, we do have some black bears over in the Western region of the state, but otherwise that's not a concern for them over here. Um, up to 70% of moose, the calves are killed by the black bears or wolves each year. Um, and that is again in the other areas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, you know, you get into those other, those other regions. At four to six years old, they are fully grown. And they do consider that a lot of them don't make it to adulthood, but once they make it to that adulthood, they have a survival rate of up to 95%. They, uh, they really rely on acute hearing to detect the predators, which means that they don't have to select their, their bedding grounds or, um, or even their forage grounds based off of a visual advantage because their hearing is so acute that they, they don't necessarily have that as a concern. They'll use deeper water to elude the, the predators. So they'll swim out into that deeper water that the bears and the wolves or mountain lions in our case um, wouldn't be able to get as, as far into. Um, they have also, <laughs> in obviously like our Alaska and uh, Northern regions, they have been known to be preyed upon by orca when they're traveling by water from one island to another. So you get up onto the, the Alaskan coasts and when they're going from that one place to another that the orcas can, are, you know, it's a deep enough and big enough area for the orcas to swim into, they actually have been known to be preyed on by the orcas for, because of that. Um, on their disease side, their two main concerns are arterial worms. That's an intestinal, well, it's an intestinal parasite that comes from a horsefly, which is similar to bot flies. Um, and it actually develops um, in, in their carotid artery and it creates heart and circulation problems. Um, and that's where it also comes back to the frost bite because with that circulation problem, they don't have the blood flow necessary and it causes not just the dewlap tail to fall off, but even the tips of the ears. The other primary is winter ticks. Um, winter ticks, the reason even though, so winter ticks are similar to wood ticks, um, except for the fact that winter ticks are dormant in the summertime when wood ticks are active and vice versa. So in the wintertime, the, the, the moose will pick up these, these winter ticks and they'll continue to grow and feed off of the moose in that, that critical time of year. And the biggest reason behind that is because moose don't groom themselves very well. So where deer and elk um, are able to groom off a bulk of their, their summer ticks, um, the, the moose don't just because of their lack of grooming. So the, the, <laughs> the, the, the severity from those ticks will be visible towards the end of winter, February and March, and may take in different forms. Um, I just, I, I just you know, watched a webinar about these the other day, and they discovered that one particular moose had, had 47,000 winter ticks on it when they discovered it. So they really do build a lot of these ticks up and they really take over the moose. Um, they say average is 30,000. So that's still a lot and can really play a part in their, their winter condition. So some of those different forms that you'll see is weight loss, poor physical condition, hair loss, appearance of wounds, um, loss of blood, obviously, 
And that leading to abnormal behavior, the animal begins to groom itself excessively suddenly. Um, they try and stop the severe itching with that. Um, they may become less fearful of humans, may appear lost or confused. They may even just stop eating altogether outside of and wander outside of their natural habitat. So now that we know a little bit about moose in general, let's talk about Shiras moose moving to Nevada. So we've actually had a many more sightings than most realize of moose wandering in and out of Nevada um, for decades, actually. The first documented sighting was in 1950s. Moose were not legally recognized as a game animal in Nevada and protected at that point. A Native American on the Duck Valley Reservation um, harvested the moose in northeastern Elko County. This prompted the Nevada Revised Statute Modification, which identified moose as a protective game animal in Nevada. In 1961, even though it was a protected species, um, another moose was harvested out of Hawaii. The hunter claimed he thought it was actually a buffalo. So from there, we go into multiple sightings, 1970s, a moose in Trout Creek area of the Granite Mountains during deer surveys, which was seen by helicopter. Um, in 81, a bull between Crittenden and the Gamble Ranch. Um, in fall of 90, a young bull between Charleston and Wikiup Creek, um, which is in uh, Hunt Unit 71. Late fall of 90, two cows and a calf on the west side of Elk Mountain in 072. Uh, in July of 91, an archery hunter reported a young bull in area um, of T Creek, which is in Unit 72 as well, 072. And then in the fall of 1991, an adult cow on Stag Mountain, um, which was hunt Unit 73, seen by two hunting parties. And I, they actually captured um, evidence of it by photos. In 93 through, through the, the fall of 94, um, five reports of a bull in uh, Area 6, which ranged from northeastern to southeastern portion of the Tuscarora area. Um, they, they did believe that that was all the same bull in that particular uh, instance. And then again in fall of 93, a cow was also seen in an adjacent drainage to where that bull was seen. <clears throat> On an unknown date, but it was sometime after that last sighting, a non-resident hunter from California, Jack Hamby, he was actually attacked by the bull during his season. He was out deer hunting with his brother, um, and saw the, the bull and decided to sneak in and get a picture of it. And the bull actually charged him from about 30 yards away. Moose are notoriously aggressive. Um, however, it's usually, usually, if a cow moose is defending her calf. Jack did end up with a fractured skull, abrasions, bruises, two black eyes. Um, doctors didn't believe his moose attack story, poor guy. Once the film developed several days later, he actually had photos to prove it. He's still alive and well in California, and he's very lucky to have lived to tell the, the, the tale because they really are an aggressive animal. They're, they're pretty territorial with their space. Then more sightings. Summer of 2008, two reports in Area 6. 2010, a wandering bull, which actually made the headlines in our local newspaper. Uh, he spent, he actually, using the corridor of Highway 93 between the Idaho border all the way to Wells, Nevada. Um, he actually spent a couple days in Wells, uh, reported on the local news, it you know, obviously circulated rapidly and people were pretty excited about it. Several uh, sightings had been noted after that, uh, but the, the, the sightings and the observations really picked up in 2013. Over 400 moose, um, observations in northeastern Nevada between uh, 2013 and 2018. 59 bulls, uh, 29 young and 30 mature. 61 cows and 10 calves were reported. There is, you know, some, some belief that some of these are the same animal that's being seen, but it's still evident that we, we are having these increasing moose observations in the area. So with that, it's not always, you know, something that gets out to everybody that's out in the field. Um, with unaware Nevada sportsmen, three cows have actually been harvested during antlerless elk season due to a misidentification. 
The hunters were fined and Endow wrote press releases um, and increased the presence of moose, which led to these signs that you see um, on this current slide. Know your target signs um, have been posted throughout the, um, the areas that you're more likely to see moose and elk in the same area. Um, and it's all just to prevent the mistaken harvest. In December of 2017, a hunter actually found remains of a moose that was potentially poached, um, even though Endow offered pretty enticing rewards to anyone with information regarding the case, no information has been, has been discovered from it. So why are they here? And I think the biggest, the biggest answer to that is because they can. Um, moving in, they're moving in from Northwestern uh, Utah, which is like east of Grouse Creek area um, and Southern Idaho. The populations up there in those areas are doing really well and they're expanding for habitat and resources because again, they're solitary. So if they start feeling pressure from, from other wildlife, from other moose, they'll just start kind of branching out and trying to find their own space. Um, mountain brush moose is what they're kind of, what they're being uh, referred to as. And it's because they're using habitat that's completely different than where they, they normally come from and where you normally would find them. The two photos of moose um, in Nevada uh, depicting the, the different habitat types. So you can see there's, there's some really nice areas and nice um, aquatic areas where they can get in there and they can get into that water and they've got that nice forage. And then you see some really dry areas. Um, <laughs> I, you can actually see the young moose in the far right picture. Uh, he's shown on the Gamble Ranch. And, um, and then the other picture is out on um, Elk Mountain in 072. So, um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to, to speed forward again. So you can see that they're using all different types of habitat as they're moving into Nevada. So what are we doing about it as Endow? Um, long before 2013 and the increased sightings, uh, moose have actually been on the radar for Department of Wildlife. Um, we did recognize a need for a plan um, quite a while ago in 1991, the Region 2 Regional Manager, Larry Barngrover, he actually contacted Idaho and Utah to discuss moose in Nevada. Biologists for both the states confirmed that their populations were doing really well and expanding their range also. They believe the sagebrush and aspen habitat type was suitable for moose and believed that similar habitats in Nevada would be suitable for the Wyoming subspecies as well, which is the Shiras. So in December of 1991, Larry Barngrover wrote a memo um, titled Moose Sightings and Management Implications. In the conclusion of the document, he stated, quote, the department should probably address the opportunity, feasibility, desirability of augmenting or establishing moose populations in suitable habitat during the next biennial big game release planning process. So as far back as 1991, having seen some observations come in and seeing some of these moose around the area, um, they recognized that there was definitely a need to prepare for it and plan for it. So with that, we fast forward to what we're doing today. Um, surveys are a little bit difficult because they're so solitary. They're not big groups to find like you would find with elk or deer. Um, so it, it's kind of a one here and a one there type of a thing. So our biologists, they've been collaring. Um, they currently have four collared cows. Um, well, I take that back. Let me fix that. <laughs> they had four collared cows in 2020, but they just added um, I believe three more, so two cows and a bull to that list. So we now have seven that are collared in the region. The biggest thing that we can do is ask for the citizen science. 90% um, of those sightings that we have gotten have come from hunters. Uh, so we really do, if you're ever out there, give us that information that you come across them, pictures, locations, um, any information about it that you can would be ideal to, to get back to us with. The next step on the endow front is another cow tag and two more bull call or another cow collar and two more bull collars. Um, ideally this winter, but it, it, it's potential that it won't be until um, a little bit later in the year. And then um, like a habitat selection model. And I'll let Carrie explain a little bit more about that. Um, essentially it's where the bulk of the time is spent and comparing that to how much of our area is desired for them. 
So with that, I think we can open it up to questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Carrie um, turn on her mic as well. And we'll let some, some questions come in. Lauren, do we have, do we have some questions? We do, yeah, we have one question uh, from Joseph Terry. He'd like to know, will there be a future hunt for moose in Nevada? And if so, is there a time frame that Endow has discussed allowing a hunt? So Carrie, I'll go ahead and let you answer that. Sure, yeah. So um, a hunt on moose is probably um, a little bit uh, a ways away. I'm going to turn off my video because my, my internet's a little shaky here. So um, anyway, that I think that um, as Julie was talking, it's, you know, our first step is to put some collars on, see how the moose are using Nevada. We don't believe we have enough moose yet to facilitate any type of hunting um, activity. And so what we will do is we'll learn how much habitat we have that would be suitable for moose. And then once we feel comfortable with that, then we could... Um, you know, we'll move forward like we do with any species and just figure out if there's um, a sustainable yield, meaning that you could have harvest without impacting the population. And obviously our moose are just barely growing in Nevada and we're learning about them. And so, so hunting may be in the future someday, but it's certainly um, going to be down the road a ways because right now we just have to figure out how many moose we think we have and then um, how they're utilizing our habitat and how much habitat we actually have available for moose in Nevada. Great, thanks, Carrie. We do have uh, another question that just came in. Uh, have they found moose in Great Basin National Park? I haven't, um, I kind of keep track of the database for moose and I have not had any sightings for there yet, but I have to tell you, I was down around Alien Success Loop Duck Creek Basin area last um, summer and I took a little walk and I thought, boy, you know, if the moose, got an opportunity to move that far south, I bet that they could be pretty happy down there because it looks like a lot of the habitat we're finding them in Northeast Nevada. So it won't surprise me that once we get um, good populations in Northeast Nevada, that the moose start moving further south and um, begin to use the Ely area as well. Oh, that'd be... All right, we do have another question. Do you know if there is breeding in Nevada or are all of these coming from other states? We do know that there's breeding in Nevada, and that's because uh, Julie was showing that picture of um, moose using habitat in Nevada, and that was actually one of our collared cows with her calf um, there. So we have documented where um, our collared cows plus other cows that other people have seen um, when they've been out having calves in Nevada. So yes, they are reproducing and staying here in the state um, year round. Great, and yeah, the questions keep coming in. This is great. So we have another one down the line. Um, it says, are they found only in the northeast of Nevada thus far, or have there been some other spots that they've been seen? Yeah, so, so far, um, as far west as we have an observation that's gotten to us was in the Santa Rosa Mountains, which is outside of Winnemucca to the north there. So that was quite a, far, quite a ways um, north. That was a young bull that was seen quite a few years ago. We haven't really had any recently. And then um, we've seen them as far south as the Ruby Mountains, uh, which is south of Elko here. There's, there's getting to be uh, quite a few that, that they're seeing in the Ruby Mountains. So they're, they're definitely uh, expanding and, and going to the west and the south um, as the years go by. All right, and someone else would like to know how good is their vision and smell? You wanna take that one, Julie? Um, I can. Uh, <laughs> their, their hearing is really their best. Um, their smell is also very good as, you know, as well. I would say if, if any of them are, if, if you were to put them in order, it would definitely be the hearing first and then the smell and then the vision. But I think it all kind of just plays a role into itself. Um, but they're, they definitely have, have great adaptations with all of that for their for their predator avoidance. Great, and we did have another question and I think you covered some of this toward the start of the presentation, but are there predators for moose in Nevada? And uh, secondary to that, are there less ticks in the sage, sage scrub environment? Um, we, we did discuss that um, the mountain lion would be their primary predator in the regions that we're finding them in here in Nevada. 
As for the ticks in the sage scrub environment, Carrie, do you have any idea on that? So um, I would say that during, you know, these moose are, so when, when you were talking about the pictures that you're showing on the screen right now, you know, that young bull that was out in that desert scrub environment was just probably moving from one place to another. We don't see them actually living in that type of habitat. So usually they're in the upper elevations in the Aspen um, mahogany and subalpine fir, that type of habitat. And there is quite a few um, ticks in the summer. But as you were discussing those uh, winter ticks, they believe that they can be housed by mule deer and don't seem to cause a lot of problems in mule deer. And it's probably because as you were discussing, they may be a little bit better groomers in that. But what happens is they, they believe that they can get on, on the moose and them not be as, um, as good of groomers, but with the winter ticks, it has a little bit more to do with mild winters and the ticks ability to survive in the winter time. So um, it has a little bit more to do with uh, temperatures probably more than habitat when we're talking about winter ticks. Great, and that actually goes nicely into another question we had regarding that temperature tolerance. Uh, there was mentioned that they can be comfortable up to 57 degrees Fahrenheit but how are they tolerating the peak of summer? Do they migrate up to higher elevations? I believe that that would be the case. Those are the types of things that we're learning with the collaring information that we're getting because those are GPS collars and they download several points a day. And so, yes, we can see when they, you know, tuck into the, the thicker trees or, or how they're using the habitat when it gets really hot. But yeah, we, so I think that that's where we're gonna find one of the limiting factors in habitat in Nevada is they gotta be able to either get high enough in elevation to get at a, a lower temperature during the summertime or um, have some other means of, of staying cool. We do believe Shiras, um, some of the moose that are doing the best west wide are these Shiras moose that, that tend to be tolerating temperatures a little bit better. Some of the um, native uh, moose that grew up in the boreal forests and all that seem to be having a much tougher time with warming climates and that, but these particular moose that I believe are using Nevada are some of the more adaptable moose that are, are a little bit more tolerant of those higher temperatures. Great. And would you have an estimate of what their individual range is within Nevada in terms of square miles? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I've been watching the collaring and I'll, I'll tell you, I kind of, I'm so excited that we, we just finally got a collar on a bull moose um, just, oh, let's see, that was last month. And I can't wait to see what the bull does because the cows are actually a little bit boring to watch <laughs> because once they find a nice um, riparian area, you know, along a river or, or something like that, the cows don't move a whole lot. Um, as a matter of fact, I have to really zoom in and make sure that they're not, they haven't died or anything like that because their <laughs> movements are so little when they and they've got all their needs met to where they're, they've got all the forage they could want, they feel comfortable, all that. They don't move around a whole lot. And so um, cows are, are, you know, sometimes they're only, uh, can live their whole year within like a five mile radius um, if they've got everything they need there. What I think we may find is um, we do see some movements. We, we put some collars on some moose in extreme Northeastern Nevada up around Goose Creek. And some of the area that they were using just north of our border in Idaho gets quite a bit of snow. And so they definitely were moving further into Nevada because of snow levels um, and that they can tolerate quite a bit of snow, but there was just more forage available in, in their southern habitat there. So I think that um, I think it's just going to kind of depend, but I, I have a feeling since we have we don't have a, a very large population of moose that the bulls are going to be the ones that are going to really um, stretch out there and cover a lot of area. And so we'll learn a lot more about that this fall when the rut hits. Great, thank you. And we have some more questions coming in. Uh, has there been any known predation by mountain lions in Nevada toward moose that we know of? We haven't documented any yet. Um, as a matter of fact, the only um, dead moose we've come across was that one that Julie was talking about that we believe may have been poached and we never got any more information. We ran across that. Um, so far, uh, any um, mortalities on moose have been that, um, you know, 
mistaken identity um, by hunters, and there's been a handful of those. But luckily so far, we have not come across any other um, moose uh, mortalities in the state yet. Great, and another question. Um, they'd like to know, will there be an opportunity for the public to attend future moose projects and captures? Oh, I hope so. Um, it's a really uh, exciting thing. We end up, you know, so moose are a little bit different than what we normally do in this state. Normally we have a capture crew in a helicopter that just nets animals and they, um, and they hobble them and then they put the, the collar on them. Whereas moose are so much bigger that a lot of times they need to be um, darted or, you know, under a, a small dose of um, drug to um, just kind of settle them down and in, in that when we um, capture them. And so uh, sometime, hopefully, I, so far it's been a little bit because we this has been our first experience uh, with capturing moose. We've been kind of just um, keeping everything kind of low key and all that. But as we get more comfortable with the use of um, the drugs that we use to, to um, use on the on the moose and we feel comfortable having that there may be an opportunity in the future where it could be a project where volunteers could come out and we could sling the moose into a into a base station but at this point uh we've been doing most of the work on the mountain in the uh winter time and so it's a little bit tough to get people there right great yeah how neat would that be <laughs> all right and we have another question are they good climbers I would say that they would be um, with their with their legs, but I guess I can't speak to that personally. Did you read anything about that, Julian? Your um, studying of moose? You know, I did not come across anything about their ability to climb. Um, I mean, the 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 most the coolest thing that I came across to me was they're they're using their forearms to climb through the snow that was really deep to avoid all four feet sinking so deep. Um, but I didn't come across anything as far as climbing ability. I wonder if it would be similar to any of the deer populations and their abilities. I would guess so, you know, and just those long legs, they can, I know that um, we were following up on some of the collared moose and um, one of them kind of uh, came out of the trees and, and saw us and you know, because those long legs, boy, it, they can cover a lot of country really quick. She got up that mountain really fast when she <laughs> thought, that, <laughs> thought that we were a little bit too close to her comfort. So I do know they can cover country really quickly. I know the one that I saw out here in Spring Creek, it, it moved very fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. They're one of those species that's a little bit deceiving, kind of like elk to where they look like they're going slow because they're such a big animal. But if you actually clock them, like you were saying, Julie, they can they can go up to 35 miles per hour. So in sometimes when they're in those um, aggressive charging incidents, they they cover ground really quick. So I would never underestimate their ability to get get to you quickly if you came across one and, and got in their way. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. We do have one final question. Uh, what time of year is the rut for moose and how long does it last? I'm not exactly sure for the exact um, time period. I'm guessing it's probably has to do with, um, you know, which cows are coming into estrus when. Um, however, the, the normal rutting time for, for at least the moose um, here in Nevada is October. And, um, and Julie was talking about vocalizations and something I learned that I thought was really interesting that, um, so like in areas where, where hunters are hunting bulls, you can call a bull and, and they could be a incredibly long ways away. And if they hear that, they'll slowly make their way um, to that area, you know, thinking it's a, a cow. And it might be like a day or two later that they show up to that spot. So, cause that was the part that, that seemed very surprising to me with our such a small, um, moose population, I was wondering how they were finding each other, but I guess those cows can make a vocalization and, and those bulls can track it down um, from a long ways away. Great, it looks like that was the last question in the Q&A box there. And I do see there are, um, there's one 
that maybe could be addressed in um, some more detail that was asked, what are some perspective areas in Nevada that could sustain moose populations outside of Northeast Nevada? So if they I know you mentioned Great Basin National Park is one, if there's, I suppose, some others that you would provide ideal habitat for them. Yeah, the, the place I can think of is maybe like central Nevada, um, maybe some of, uh, you know, towards the Arctome Wilderness or um, the Takimas maybe, or the, you know, Tua Tuyabis there, Table Mountain. Um, those areas have uh, a lot of aspen and thick cover and all of that. However, as you go further south in Nevada, you know, of course, the temperatures are going to be a little bit higher. And so um, I think that would be the limiting factor of them going too much further south is just that you've got um, you've got high, hotter temperatures during the summertime. Great, thanks. It looks like that's all of the questions here. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been another great webinar. Uh, to help us better serve you, please complete the survey that you'll receive a link for at the end of the program. And get outside and embrace the outdoors. Uh, just make sure you practice that responsible recreation with it. For more um, of our, our webinars and our presentations and events coming up, you can go to the Nevada Department of Wildlife Facebook page and click on events, and you'll see a whole calendar full of events that we've got coming up over the next couple of months. If you have any questions about any of this, feel free to email me. My name, my email is on the bottom of my video right now. Um, and again, if we don't have any more questions, then we'll go ahead and close out for the day. Have a great evening.